From the Holy Gospel according to Mark. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John the Baptist appeared in the desert proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. People of the whole Judean countryside and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. John was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He fed on locusts and wild honey, and this is what he proclaimed. One mightier than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop and loosen the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. We've begun once again, as you know, the Advent season, a time leading up to Christmas. And many of us have our traditions, our customs that we do every year about this time. For some people, it's, you know, watching Hallmark Christmas movies. Uh, for some people, it's doing other activities. I, I completed an annual tradition on Thanksgiving, actually, and I watched Die Hard, a great Christmas movie. Uh, you know, and I was texting out Happy Thanksgiving as Hans Gruber was falling, or Happy, uh, uh, Merry Christmas, rather, as Hans Gruber was falling from the tower at the end of the movie. Uh, one of the traditions uh, that I have for the Advent season. Another one is just watching, you know, shows on a repeated basis. I kind of, uh, towards the end of the year, I'm ready for those uh, moments where I can just kind of zone out and watch a good movie. And I've got a list of those that I repeat. And I just finished re-watching The King's Speech. Great movie. Uh, it's been out a number of years now. I'd highly recommend it. Uh, and that was on my mind as I was thinking about a homily for this morning. So this morning I'm going to kind of uh, talk a little bit about this wonderful movie, wonderful film that was made, uh, called The King's Speech. And the movie really centers around two characters, Bertie, who's the prince that eventually becomes king, and a speech therapist um, named Lionel Loeb. And the two have kind of a, um, a meeting at the very beginning that uh, w is unexpected, and, and it leads to this friendship that blossoms. Uh, the, the prince, um, Bertie, as he's called throughout the film by his family, uh, he has a speech impediment. He has a stammer, and he stutters. And at the very beginning of the film, he's trying to give this speech and it's a lot of silence as he's trying to wrestle with the words, getting them out. And so he hires a bunch of experts, and they have him do all sorts of very odd things. One of them has him put marbles in his mouth and tries to speak, you know, tries to make him speak, and it's just not working. He's having no hope of improving uh, his stammering problem until he goes and meets with Lionel Logue. Now, Lionel, we don't know it at this time in the movie, but he doesn't have any credentials to actually help people uh, with speech impediments. He doesn't have the schooling, he doesn't have the doctorates, he doesn't have the certificates, he has nothing. 
And so there's this interplay between them the whole time where the prince is calling him Dr. Logue, and he's insisting, just call me Lionel. Uh, and there's that banter back and forth, like, you know, uh, trying to, you know, Lionel is continually telling him, I'm not a doctor, but the prince isn't picking up on it. Uh, anyway, Lionel has had experience working with people who were traumatized in uh, World War I. He has, uh, they came back shell-shocked, uh, in, and he has experience working with them to try and get them uh, to talk again. And so he's using that experience on the prince and making strides as he's going forward to actually get him to speak. He's giving him techniques uh, to train his voice uh, to be able to give speeches. And as it so happens, when the prince's father, King George V, I believe it was, passes away, his older brother takes the throne for a little bit, but then resigns because of a scandal that's brewing. And so he's given the throne. And at uh, right before his coronation at Westminster, Westminster Abbey, I always have to think, because Westminster Abbey is the Anglican one, Westminster Cathedral is the Catholic one, and I always have to think which one's which. It's Westminster Abbey they were at, uh, and... And Westminster Abbey, this is like the, the culmination of the movie. This is the high point of the whole movie. Uh, uh, Bertie and Lionel are um, having this dialogue because Bertie just found out that Lionel isn't at all qualified to treat his speech impediment. He has no credentials. And the people breathing down Bertie's neck are saying, this man shouldn't be here. He's just a commoner. He's taking you uh, for a ride as he's training you. Uh, and... What happens in this one scene, the culmination of the whole movie, is Lionel Logue sits on Prince Edward's chair, the one that the royalty would sit on as they're being crowned, and Bertie just gets furious that this common man is sitting on the chair and he's shouting at Lionel, and Lionel basically says, I don't care how many royal bottoms have sat on this chair, uh, you know, you're know, you never going to sit here because you yourself have said uh, that you're not, a, you're not capable of being king, you're not capable, uh, you're not qualified of doing what you need to do, you have no voice. And Bertie, out of anger, doesn't stammer a bit, and he screams, I have a voice. And that's when Lionel says, yes, you do. And he kind of points out the fact that he hasn't been stuttering this whole time, that he's been yelling at Lionel. And he's like, and now we need to get ready so that you can you know, speak and, and, and say the words uh, uh, at your... Uh, inauguration at, at your um, coronation. And at the very end of the movie, uh, Bertie gives this wonderful uh, speech that's um, the first of the wartime speeches as England enters into World War II. Uh, and he does a phenomenal job. Uh, he does, it's just remarkable if you contrast the, the beginning speech and the speech uh, at the end. I don't know why I love this movie so much, and I don't know uh, what it is that draws me back to watch it again and again. Perhaps it's the idea that a commoner with no experience can somehow have an impact uh, on the message that the king gives. Perhaps it's the message that um, this man who, who's got a stutter, who's not a good speaker, has to be the one to lead a country against Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany, a man who's very good at speaking and has um, you know, already started conquering countries around him, a very, uh, very energizing speaker versus a stammer. Perhaps it's that juxtaposition, especially knowing how the war turned out. Uh, I don't know what it is about the movie, uh, but perhaps it's telling in another way a story that we're all familiar with, the story of John the Baptist and Christ. John the Baptist himself was a commoner. I mean, he came from a little remote village, and he was one that was preparing the way for the king to come. He was one that was proclaiming the message in the desert uh, of repentance, and so many experts in the community were baffled. How is this man achieving success, proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming this message of repentance? How is he doing so well? He doesn't have the training. He doesn't have uh, the qualifications. Uh, he's proclaiming the gospel, and people are listening. And eventually, of course, he's the one uh, that helps Jesus inaugurate his reign by baptizing him. Uh, and so you have this, this voice in the desert preparing the way for the king. Uh, it's a great story in our scriptures. It's a great story when it comes out on film, and it's a great story when it plays out in each and every one of our lives, because ultimately Jesus calls us to be his voice. He wants us to be the one proclaiming him uh, in the streets, prepare the way of the Lord 
uh, to those around us. And to be completely honest, there can be some times where it seems like we're way out of our league. We're way, you know, where we have, we're way over in over our heads, as they, uh, as they say, especially when we're first stepping out with sharing our faith with other people. I can think of several times myself when I, as a beginner, was taking those initial baby steps of evangelization, and I made mistakes along the way. I can think of one time when I was down on the beaches of Florida in college trying to evangelize. We were supposed to evangelize, and I was actually terrified of talking to people. And so it was this really hard thing to do when we're on the beaches. We had, we'd come, they, they'd given us this quote-unquote scavenger hunt where we are supposed to go up to people and ask them to sign off on our little paper if they were doing certain things. And so you have like a man smoking a pipe. You're supposed to go up and have him initial. And the, it was a kind of a, um, a way to get a conversation started. If they ask, what are you doing down here? You tell them, well, this is what we're doing. We're sharing the gospel. Would you like to hear about Jesus Christ? And sure enough, you know, we'd go up to people and they sign, oh, so you're doing it. They'd say to us, oh, you're doing a scavenger hunt. What else are you doing down here? And my response is nothing, just a scavenger hunt. Uh, you know, I, I was that terrified to actually be the voice preparing uh, the way of the Lord. Yet, after uh, some practice, after some time, after uh, a couple more mistakes, I started learning how to move in the power of the Spirit to actually share the gospel with people. And new pathways opened up, and we've had remarkable success in some of the missions that I've been a part of. Uh, but it takes that practice uh, to, to get out there and be the voice that we're called to be. We do have a voice. It's been given to us by our baptism, and we're called to use it. This Advent season, as we are preparing our hearts to receive Jesus Christ at Christmas, let's remember we're also being prepared to be his voice. We're the ones who are being prepared to open up the avenues of grace, not only in our own community, but I mean among ourselves, but also to those around us who may not know Jesus Christ. We're called to be that voice. We're called to help people and uh, to lead them closer to the King. And the Lord, He gives us this task because the message of salvation is a message that's incredibly important. The trials of our day and age uh, come to a culmination, come to a, um, an end uh, when the kingdom of God comes. And so let us pray then for the grace as we contemplate John the Baptist, as we contemplate missions work, uh, to be the voice of Christ that we're called to be, to be the ones who witness uh, to those around us the power of Christ working in our midst, to be the evangelists that truly prepare the way for the King.